Hi folks, welcome to class 10 of uh, International NGOs and uh, in this section I want to take you through a few key concepts in uh, how INGOs and even domestic NGOs in the US impact the space of migration. Now this is a very contentious and hot button issue as you're all aware and uh, NGOs have played a very significant role. I think that's something I want to start off by saying over the last say 20-25 years both uh, both domestically as well as internationally. Now domestically uh, some of the issues that they have worked on include um, the most important or the top of the mind issues include migration from Latin America uh, specifically uh, undocumented workers and also more recently the issue of refugee resettlement. So uh, I want to use these two of course there are a dozen other issues but I, since uh, we have limited time and uh, we need to cover quite a bit within this uh, allocated space. So let's focus on these two issues and look at maybe one example of an NGO that I'm very familiar with to illustrate what kind of activities they carry out, what is the resistance they might face with the state or you know, the kind of support they receive from civil society. So uh, in this segment we'll try to at the end of this hopefully you'll, you'll be able to understand uh, the issue of migration from the perspective of civil society, from the perspective of in, uh, NGOs working in this space. And as I pointed out, what are the legal or moral challenges that confront them? And uh, how does the state see these NGOs? Are they always partners or sometimes are they adversaries that work against the state uh, when it clashes with, with their stated mission? And how do they build legitimacy? So these are some of the important core uh, questions that, that we'll try to answer. Now take a few minutes again to uh, name a few NGOs uh, that you're familiar with that work in this space. Pause this video, take a few minutes to reflect on what you think are the most effective strategies they've used to push for if they are progressive, greater inclusion of uh, migrants into American society or if they're very conservative and uh, don't believe in migration much, what, what are the tactics strategies they've used and also how effective have they been so uh, here I, I, I must share my own biases. Uh, I haven't studied the conservative groups too much. I personally don't identify with their uh, most of their opinions or ideas. I, in this sense, I lean very liberal uh, as, as far as migration is concerned. However, I'm familiar with most of the big picture arguments, most of the strategies used, and uh, I, I, I'll be happy to discuss them with you. Uh, however, the example I've also used in this is from a very left-leaning, very progressive Jewish organization, uh, HIAS, which we'll discuss a little later. Just want to share my biases and uh, move forward with that. Uh, the, share, the reading that we've shared is by Ibrahim and Christensen. This is again a case study of an organization that deals with uh, immigrants uh, in the US. Uh, and this article builds on the article that you read earlier by Ibrahim on accountability. So essentially, uh, it's, a, it's a good read in the sense that it caters to, it, it helps you concretize your ideas of accountability as well as uh, the working of an uh, organization that works in this space. It's one of the reasons I chose this. And as they point out, uh, their finding is that accountability should meet uh, not only the needs of the donors, but also the, what they call a horizontal accountability. So that's because uh, the pressures to navigate donors uh, sometimes becomes overbearing. So, and they argue that it does not always yield uh, the kind of results that lead to better mission accomplishment or move towards uh, achieving their mission. So here I, I use the definition of accountability they offer as uh, the means by which individuals and organizations report to a recognized authority and are held responsible for their actions. So that's somewhat of a common sense definition, but it's good to have one. If we can use that as a working definition. And uh, so in, in that sense, their big finding or conclusion is that uh, nonprofits are better off investing in internal grantee capacity uh, for lateral communication rather, rather than by so soliciting greater detailed reporting. Because as we have argued in class and as we have, I have pointed out, uh, reporting is seen as a big mechanism for accountability and it's sort of the 
de facto method. Now here they're making the counterintuitive argument that not always is greater detail accounting, or sorry, reporting a better way of accountability. So they say it's better to invest in helping them build better uh, communication because accountability end of the day is also about trust, about how much the grantees, uh, you know, trust uh, the person who they're supporting. So there's, there's that ele element as well, which they say we need to focus. Now, I want to step away from the reading a little bit and focus, talk a little about the discourses of migration, sort of the, uh, the, the contextual debates around migration and where NGOs play into that part. So um, you, you, oh, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with the, with the big arguments uh, the pro on the progressive side as well as the conservative side. Uh, the progressives say migrants build the country. This is a country of migrants, so we should be welcoming and you know uh, be open to a uh, greater number of people coming in. Uh, conservatives argue otherwise. They say uh, you need to, of course, many of them, including libertarians, would say we need a broader, uh, you know, open migration policy, but only let in highly qualified people or you know uh, things of that kind. So there is, again, within the conservative spectrum, there is a gradation of, you know, right from letting in people to complete shutdown. Uh, and we have seen uh, some of that playing out with the with this administration. Now, on the progressive side, again, one of the big arguments, which is not often well known, is the whole democratic renewal process. And that, that's made by Robert Wood now, a tremendous scholar. I, I also recommend this book, uh, American Mythos. Uh, which uh, I want to tie in that argument he makes in this book, which is essentially that uh, most Americans believe in this myth, like even people who are not here and want to come to the country essentially believe in this myth of America being the land of opportunities. Now, he says it's a myth because uh, there are a lot of things that this myth incorporates and it leaves out a lot of things. For instance, the kind of social capital networks that you need to succeed, even if you come here as a migrant, the kinds of uh, you know intangible uh, support as well as moral support you need from institutions, from policy frameworks, which are often not mentioned. When when uh, basically this book is a compilation of exhaustive interviews as well as other kinds of research that he's carried out, and uh, some of the interviews are fascinating. When you read the book, you'll realize that a lot of people are very honest and frank and they tell him that if not for their uncle who lent them money or if not for those neighbors who were extremely supportive or their family members who uh, offered them shelter after they came to the US, they, these migrants would not have succeeded. So he says that if we don't examine the, these myths closely and really critique them for what they are, then we are doing ourselves a disservice as well as uh, taking things uh, for granted. So even when we think of migration, uh, what now is basically pushing us to think a little deeper and also more closely in terms of what makes this myth real and what makes it what what might make it fail. So these are uh, I think this is a, one of the crucial ideas we must keep in mind as we examine migration in, in today's uh, America. So two acts that uh, I want you to do some research. Uh, 1965 is the Hard Seller Act, landmark legislation again, which uh, basically uh, lifted uh, restrictions on migration from Asia and Africa. So prior to this, there was race-based migration. I mean, there wasn't much migration happening from Asia or, or Africa. It was purely for, uh, uh, as in non-white migration was restricted. And post-1965, that ban was lifted. So hence, you had lots of people from Asia, um, Africa coming into the US and in the context of the refugee uh, crisis the 1980 Refugee Act is also very important and that guides much of the policy making and legislation in the country today it is uh, uh, it is it, you could be it could be considered a landmark legislation in that sense uh, switching gears slightly I want us to focus uh, on we spoke about this in the charity class but Please focus on uh, the chart here, which is a comparison of official aid, uh, official development assistance (ODA) versus private charity. Now, as you can see, this is uh, from the Hudson Institute. These figures from their uh, report. Uh, so you can see that uh, the number of 
the amount of money that is going from private philanthropy remittances is uh, enormous as compared to ODA. Uh, this is not to say that they are a replacement for official development assistance, which the current administration is arguing for, but rather uh, I think the other lesson we can take from this is that a private initiative and easier access of, of flow of money, as we talked about remittances earlier, is important because this can also be, it, it is a lifeline for millions of people around the world, given how many people send money to their country of origin and the kinds of networks that are built that also, uh, you know, make America look nice. It, it builds soft, soft power for the U.S. So this slide basically tries to capture that. And uh, in the context of migration, I think uh, the reason I even have the slide here is to point out the fact that uh, if the migrants start come stop coming if i mean look at tourism look at uh, people who are here to work temporarily if they stop coming so there might be even an impact on philanthropy there might be an impact on remittances and of course with this administration they're trying to cut down on uh, oda as well so this picture might change dramatically in the next one or two years and not for the positive it might have a very negative impact both on the us as well as on the other receiving countries so something to watch out in the near future as you as you examine the space. Uh, as I mentioned, as of uh, the last 15 to 20 years, some of the major issues or debates playing out uh, and how nonprofits have been involved in the space, both domestically and internationally. Uh, so two areas that we can look at is migration from Central, Central America. Uh, and related to that point is the whole notion of undocumented workers in the U.S. and as to who are estimated to be around 11 million. And uh, this the, during this election cycle, it was a huge issue. And even otherwise, it, it remains a big issue uh, for various reasons. And of course, uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the refugee resettlement process and uh, how that has been impacted by, by the current administration. And all of this, you could say, is, or at least the, the Syrian refugee part is linked to the post-9-11 anxieties of, uh, you know, uh, having a stronger country uh, with, with people who believe in American democracy, its systems, and uh, I think much of this is also a very uh, race-related race issue in the sense that uh, there is, of course, everybody knows that demographically, the number of uh, non-white people is increasing. I think that also has led to uh, various racial anxieties, as several scholars have pointed out. And I think that's leading to some of the extreme rhetoric that we are, we are hearing. And uh, most people in the policy circles in uh, the uh, NGO space are aware of this. But I think uh, how to tackle this and how to make sense of this uh, sort of panic is, is what is at the heart of many of these debates here. And uh, I, I want to start uh, sort of wrapping up this, seg this segment uh, by really pointing to the core role of INGOs. Let's take the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, or HIAS, as an example. Now, they work across various sectors. Uh, look up their website. I would urge you to spend some time there and really try to appreciate the kind of work they do in advocacy and policy research. They also do lobbying. They lobby Congress for on their positions. They actually do the physical work of resettlement. So they actually work with UNHCR and other um, you know agencies of the United Nations and other INGOs to bring in physically uh, various refugees from around the world, or at least the conflict zones where, where they're coming from. And they work with local faith-based partners to resettle refugees, and also offer assistance, legal assistance, financial assistance to. Uh, to various people who, who are being served. Uh, this is uh, some of their uh, messaging is based on their own the, the Jewish experience of World War II and prior to that. So this is one email I received not too long back, which compared you know the the turning away of uh, various thousands of uh, Jewish refugees uh, from the U.S. Uh, soil, uh, comparing that with uh, you know the Trump ban on. Uh, or rather stopping of the refugee resettlement process. Uh, so this is some of some of the work that they do. With this, I, 
Uh, I want to leave you with some ideas and thoughts. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. And uh, I hope you have a good weekend and see you on Tuesday. Thank you.